Welcome, Josh, and we're so excited to have you on one of the very first episodes of the Jump Music Initiative podcast. So welcome. Thank you for being here. Well, thanks for having me, you two. This is Good to see you, Josh. Good it's to see nice you, seeing Thank everybody. You. I wish we were in the same room. <laughs> Soon enough. Soon enough. Yeah, it's, it, it's nice being in the same room with people, but it is nice that we have the technology that we can just do this sort of thing and just check in with everybody and make sure we're all ha- healthy and safe and, and that. In, yeah, absolutely. Can you, let's jump right in. Can you give us a little bit of background on maybe, um, well, yourself, uh, how you got into uh, music or being a producer or just sure. following that path? Um, totally, my path is just, it comes from being this little skater punk from Regina and just, we've always had the idea of, of like, we can do anything ourselves. And I was always into skateboarding, but also what followed in that is the music within the skateboard videos was a lot of punk rock. So automatically I'm listening to, you know, Black Flag and Bad Brains and Husker Du and Descendants, bands like Minutemen. I could go on about, about that, but I mean like it's, they've all had this kind of DIY attitude of just like, just do it yourselves. And I love that as a, as, a, as a skateboarder, but also it turned me on to just like, oh, I'd love to start playing music like that, this kind of energetic sort of like hard hitting music. And so that helped me just pick up a bass guitar when I was young. And we just started writing songs automatically. Like it was never a, it was never a cover band sort of mentality. It was just automatic like, well, let's put three chords together and see what happens. And I mean, some of those early songs were probably just, it might've been just like two chords back and forth, but the aggression was there and the the fun was there. And that kind of, it started off my career as not a career, but like I was always the one person in the band that had the vision to go to the studios and use best, best sort of use of time in the studios. Because a lot of times with bands like that, we could really only afford maybe a day of studio time. So it'd be like, well, let's just try to get three songs really quick. And and it was always like, I look back on the recordings, they were what they were, but you know, it, they did sound like a day of recording time. <laughs> um, but it kind of catapulted me in a way that like, well, I could make music and I I, I could, be the one in that seat pushing all the buttons, making those decisions. That scared the crap out of me because anytime you go to those studios, it was like pretty intimidating. Like, how do you know how everything's wired or how do you know what every button does, that sort of thing. But it was just, okay, well, let's just do it and not worry about it. Like the worst thing you can do is, is fall and then keep falling. And I think that's been like my whole thing for the last, I've been doing this for about 20 years. And it's like, failing is fine as long as you can just get up and keep going. So in skateboarding, you fall a lot to get it once. So in in this life, it's like, just try to fuck up. Sorry, I'm (laughs) trying to not say that, but yeah, just um, fail and, yeah. and but learn from those mistakes and keep going. So yeah, that was, that's kind of what got me into it. Cool. I love where a band, the intent is there. This is how we play it in our jam, in, in our jam room or live, but there's some looseness within it, but it is, that sounds like us. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but some bands want to be the best of themselves where they might want to have everything really perfect and, and move it around. And, you know, cause some musicians they play behind the beat or in front of the beat and you kind of have to move things around or some that's actually kind of what makes them awesome. Right. You know? Like the Rolling um, Stones, Keith Richards plays pretty behind the beat, but it's really cool. For young bands, how important uh, is the click track? How 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 big a role do you think that needs to play in their preparation? 
it's, I don't know. I've, I've tried to answer this a few times and I look at what kind of band they are and also where they want to see themselves. Are they looking at giving a, if the presentation is to, you know, we're a jam band, we want it, we want to play small venues and we want to maybe get on small college stations. I don't think the role of the click track is all that beneficial. Where why don't you just get the best recording possible and then not worry about it. But if, if they're set on things like, I want to get on top 40 radio, which to be honest, I don't think it's a really a goal that anybody should look at to do a first recording. Mm -hmm. I think you should just, on a first recording, I think you should just get the best version of yourself. Mm -hmm. It's a good snapshot in time. You know, the bands that I, I've loved never really worried about that, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but it's, it's just one of those things like sometimes a drummer can't, like their timing is so bizarre that any of the other musicians, it might be hard to follow. But I usually like to see a band prior to recording just so I can get a gauge of where they're at. So what yeah. Are some of the, sorry, are you? I, th I are think I'm done. <laughs> I could talk to about hours on one question and not answer it. <laughs> <For sure>. <laughs> <laughs> what are some of the best things you think an artist or band can do before ever coming into the studio in terms of maybe preparing demos, solidifying some production ideas, all those sort of things that they should do before? If there's, if there's a little roadmap on every song, I mean, it would, it would blow my mind on how much that would make a difference in the studio. And as simple as just like song name, like finished song titles, a lot of times I don't even get that. But this would be like my dream list would be finished song titles, lyrics printed out, um, even simple chord arrangements, if I seen that, and it, it doesn't have to be crazy, but it could just say like verse, E, C, G, right. uh, chorus, this, these chords, simple. Like you don't have to go really, you don't have to get really perfect, but at least we know like if I'm talking to you and I'm like, you know, that G seems weird, something's weird or some, something's clashing. And also when it's written out like that, some musicians like the bass player, for instance, might go, oh, it's actually a G there? <laughs> I've been playing this and it sounds cool. Is there a reason why? Or is it totally out to lunch? Mm -hmm. Sometimes in a jam room, you can't totally hear yourself. So it sounds cool, but you don't know why. Mm -hmm. So that's a good, as a band, you can kind of write that out. Um, but, and then also like little things like as a singer, if you hear in this chorus, like I'd really love if this, like I sing this line, but I would love if it, there was a delay doing this. If there was like little production notes like that, just saying, minimal things or as a drummer you know i'd really love this verse if there was like this distorted drum kit just kind of pushing and then in the chorus it opens up really wide and you know you might not know how to say it but at least there's like rough ideas on on how you kind of envision it and then that opens up the conversation as we're recording to be like oh yeah i remember you said in your notes there's this thing in the verse what do you and then I could show examples on how I could get there. Because ultimately, I mean, as a band or as an artist, it's your recording. It's not mine. I'm just, I'm just there to help guide it, you know? And that's, as a role as an engineer or producer, that's what I'm here for, is just to get your vision on the page. That idea of a, giving you a roadmap, like, you know, with, with arrangement, chords, lyrics, yeah. like, I feel terrible. I, I don't think I've ever done that. Yeah, when, when, I mean, it sounds so easy. But, but it's so smart. Done it. yeah. It's so smart and it's so simple. I, I'm, I, 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 I'm taking notes. That's a great, great piece of advice. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm as guilty as anybody. Like any time it's like I'm producing something even, and it's like I'm supposed to be the one in control of this. And it's like I have it. I, I'm just like, 
I'm mixing it and I'm like, oh, that's what the words are. <laughs> right. You know, like I should know all this, but yeah, no, it's it, those simple things as a band. It's, and sometimes it's as a band, you can kind of delegate people to do different things. You know, like don't put it all on the singer to, to do everything, to get the chord arrangements, to get the lyrics, to, you know, like as a singer, you could be like, okay, I'll, I'll write out the lyrics and everybody, if you have like light ideas, just even like top of your head ideas, jot them down and then, and then we'll just copy paste it on one document. And that Josh, way, yeah. yeah. Can you just give me a quick overview just for, cause some, some young musicians listening to this podcast, they might not even really be totally clear on like the difference between say an engineer and a producer or why somebody would need a producer. Can you just give, I know you can get really in depth, um, but can you just yeah. give a, a quick, a general overview of what a producer does and what they do for you and, and why, you know, you could, you would look at somebody. We'll, we'll take it. I'm going to go, there's kind of two different producers. So I'm going to go with why a band would hire a producer. Okay. And we'll look at that as opposed to just having an engineer. Uh, a producer's role in a, within a band scenario is really to just keep everybody in, in check, keeping, making sure the budget is, stays where the budget stays, mm. and just making sure everybody is like performing their best, doing what the intent of the project, making sure that stays as the intent of the project the whole way through. So a producer's role to me is just making sure that we're, we're staying with that original intent the whole way through. It doesn't sway just because this is cool now. Um, where an engineer, it's just basically listening. An engineer worries about all the gear within the studio and making sure that you're getting the best possible sounds on the canvas as, as possible. So an engineer can play the producer role and I do quite a bit where I'll talk to the artist quite a bit and see where their vision's at and then I'll just make sure that happens. Or sometimes I have a producer that comes in and I'll work side by side with that producer and they'll guide the band and I'll just listen to the producer where I might not even talk to the band. You know, it might just be like quick hellos and stuff like that, but it's more like one-on-one -on -one with the producer. And sometimes bands, there'll be one person within that band that kind of plays the producer role. Not even kind of, like I usually find every band, there's one producer in the band. And that's the one person that you kind of like, I don't know, I don't want to call it the alpha of the band, but there's like, they, they have the vision in check and they'll help guide the process. Hopefully that ends. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's, that's a, that was, thank you. That's cool. Yeah. That's awesome. So I just wanted to ask if there's any other producers that inspired you or if you kind of have your own path and you, or if that yeah. was something you've been kind of thought about? Definitely. Yeah, there's, there's been some producers. Um, there's a guy named Ken Andrews that I've looked at quite a lot. He was in this band called Failure. And they're like, they're an indie band out of California. Um, they started out, they, their first record, they went into another producer that I was a big fan of. His name was Steve Albini. And he kind of dubs himself an engineer first, more than a, a producer, but I'll be the first one. Like his records sound like Steve Albini records. So it's, he's a producer. Um, but he, it's kind of this, again, it goes back to a DIY idea where Ken Andrews, he never really liked the work that Steve Albini did. So on the next record, he was just like, you know what? Let's take the label budget and we'll buy all the gear. And so the label gave them about 150,000 to do their record, which now, could you imagine to get? Oh my God. Yeah. But this was Crazy. like 90s and it was when labels still had money. Well, they still do, but you know. Um, 
but he, they took that money and they just bought all the gear and they still like they're make still making records and still using some of that gear that they from the original purchase hmm. and most of the people that i like aspire to look at they've kind of been in that role uh, another one is bill stevenson he came from this band called descendants he played in bands like black flag and descendants and all and he's they took their label money from an album and they just bought it they bought all the gear and then opened up a studio in like the cheapest town they could find was fort collins colorado and it was like unheard of like why would you live in fort collins it was it was just cheap so they built a studio there to make their albums and they've since gone on to make incredible records but it was it was just this attitude of like let's just do it ourselves mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's it's never been like this heavyweight sort of people, but it's it's I've inspired or the people that have inspired me of just with this, they've always had an idea of like we can just do it ourselves, mm -hmm. you know. I like and it. Yeah, that's, fire. Yeah, that's a very skater attitude. You're right. Yeah, yeah. Just <laughs> we'll just go do it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Who who are some of the uh, uh, artists that you've worked with that uh, you've had some really great experiences with them, some of your favorite uh, favorite moments in the studio or, or uh, you know, people that you've worked with? Oh, man. I know there's, I know that's a tough question because there's, I know there's many, but well, even if you could give us I'll one say, or two. I'll say a recent one. So, um, and I'm only saying this because it's weird because you only really think about the stuff you're working on presently. Mm -hmm. Like for me to like try to think what I've done over the last 20 years, it's like, it, it takes a minute. But what I've been really liking lately is, um, so Michael Bernard Fitzgerald and I, we just finished a record and we finished it in February, but we spent a year doing it. Um, what I loved about that record is that we wouldn't settle. Like we weren't, like he wrote, and he's a brilliant writer and he wrote and some amazing songs stuff that like he probably for that record he was upwards to 50 or 60 songs and these aren't like demos these are done songs and to the point that if i showed you some of these you're like how do you choose like all these are really good but we wanted to go so far down the rabbit hole on that record that it had a, an absolute intent on why we're making this record. So every song, we needed to find the theme. And that took, we were probably like 40 songs deep before we found the theme and we didn't even know what it was. He didn't even know what he really wanted to write about. And he was co-writing and writing by himself. And, and then finally, like, he did this song called Love Valley. And we started producing this one demo up and then I showed it to a few of my peers, uh, this uh, producer named Howard Redekop. He's out of Vancouver and he's kind of like my touchstone. I always like throw stuff at him. I'm like, am I off base? So I threw this one and he's like, that's done. And I'm like, no, no, it's just a demo. It's like, it's, we got to redo everything. He's like, no, like it's mixed. Wow. It didn't change anything. That's what you guys should be doing. And then, so I took it back to Michael and we're like, okay, let's do the test. Maybe let's test to see if he's wrong. So let's send it to, and we, um, we picked our dream engineer to mix it. Like who would be our dream engineer if we were to have this, and I'm not going to say his name because we didn't end up using him. But if we had a dream engineer, who would it be? So we sent it to that engineer. And like, it cost a lot of money, like a couple thousand dollars US. And we got it back and we're like, Howard was right. Oh, wow. like, this is, it's not right. It was right before. So that jump started. So we looked at Love Valley as like, okay, how, how did we do this? Why did it work? And the song was forward thinking. It wasn't about a past. It was about where he wanted to go in life. So we wrote, well, we, 
he wrote the whole album with that intent was like, I want to go here in life. This is where I vision life to be. And we also stripped it down to, to go, well, if you want just a simple life, like out on the farm, right by a river, out in a valley, like all those themes, why would we put this big production behind it? Let's keep it really simple. So we scaled back all the production to the point that a lot of times we would put a lot on the canvas and then mix it would scale it down. And we scaled it down and scaled it down. But we got to the point we we're mixing this thing and we're like, how much less can we go? And we'd keep shedding those layers. And, and it would be minimal stuff, like minimal compression on the vocals. We go, maybe it doesn't need any compression. And most of the things were just, most of the EQ moves were just taking out some low end. And we're taking out low end. We weren't doing big EQ sort of things. It was just, just the right sound, the right mic, and that's it. Don't overthink it. And it was so, but we nailed the intent. Like, but it was, it was a lot of conversations. And we'd ask ourselves, we'd check in constantly. So that was a fun record because it was, it was a strong intent. And we followed that intent all the way to the end. Good or bad, I don't know. That's, <laughs> and, but we're happy see- with it. It seems that you followed that intent even in spite of the process because the process was almost, your process was almost backwards in the end, you know, mm-hmm. by taking things away and, and, and sticking to a minimal, like that's, that's hard to do, I'm sure, sometimes, especially when you're used to just adding things, you know. Yeah, and it so, all sounds great. Mm-hmm. Of course. Yeah. That's, that's the funniest thing is that, you know, as, as bands and as artists or musicians, like the more stuff you put on, it just, it's beautiful. And it just adds so much beauty to it, you know? And it's like, but at the end, you know, you're just, you're, you're gilding it too much. And it's like, well, we don't need all that. And I guess that's one thing that, uh, you know, you can keep in mind about being in the studio is that when you're, when you're in the studio and I, like, you know, I'm thinking about being in that control room with you listening, you know, uh, in that environment, uh, you know, it sounds so great and there's all this sort of stuff. Um, but you have to keep in mind that not everybody will be listening to it in that, in such a setting, you know? They might be in their car. They might be somewhere else where, where you have to keep that in mind. You just make decisions based on that too sometimes. Yeah, it's, I always say my, my favorite produced song ever, and it's not even the music I really listen to, but you know that song Single Ladies? Mm-hmm. Or I don't even know if that's the actual name of that song. But you know the I'm, song. Yeah, for sure. Listen to that song and listen to how minimal that song is. There's nothing. There's at most three elements at once because the human brain can only listen at once. You can only pick out three things. You go in a crowded space, try to listen to more than three people. There's tons of people talking, but try to listen to more than three. We can only really focus on three elements. Mm -hmm. So at any given song, those three elements. Are, have to be strongest in the mix. But you can have some other like just air in the mix. But if, if you want something to be heard, if it's a vocal, don't put a bunch of guitars at that line. If you want something impactful at one time, it, you know, you got to get rid of one of the elements. So if it's like, I have something strong to say at this one moment, strip it right down so you make sure you get heard. Mm. That's that's very, really interesting to hear you say that. That's very cool. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. So right now, I know there's kind of a big push for singles and EPs, especially for young artists and bands. But do you think there's something to be said about doing a full album and going back to that sort of way of looking at it? Or I, I would I would hope there is. <laughs> Gosh, I love I love full albums. I still love full albums. I. I'm a well, and I have like a pretty, I have a half hour drive to work every day. So I'll just put on an album and listen. Um, what I really like is when a band has a theme to a record. Right. And I, I, I can't really say what, where the, where the world is going, but I would hope. And over the last few months, if anything we've learned is like, 
let's take a step back and breathe. Um, so I think to me, I feel the album's going to come back. You know, it's not going to be about like, oh, you need to get the single out there and you need to get content out there and you need to, right. you got to worry about all these boxes and you have to, how about just like, maybe just document making something great, like a big piece, you know, and, and a big record. And I, and I hope bands are going to do that. Um, it's funny it you would, say. It would be something. almost like going back for the, the sake of the art of it. Yes. Right. Yeah, and I, I think art is coming back. I think what we've learned over the last three or four months is that no, we we just got to do what we love, and let's make art again. And I think artists will see that is that singles are just it's a flash in the pan, but there's no staying power in singles. Um, it's it's good for right now, and if maybe. It, you're doing a few singles to to have a body of work in a year and those singles are put onto it but singles and eps it's it goes away really quick and there's no staying power there's no um there's no uh like in the house it would be the foundation there's no foundation to the artist because yes. you're just looking at these like one off singles where a body of work is if it's all really good, there's a huge foundation already to that artist. Mm -hmm. And and you can see that with any good long standing band is that there's a good foundation to their art. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I Maddie, yeah, I hope. Holy moly. <laughs> yeah. Well said, Josh. Well, well said. Yeah. 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 Maddie, I know that uh, you're going into the studio pretty soon. Are there yes. are there any Questions that you have specifically for Josh on anything to that end at all, or Josh honestly answered some really great questions that I know we would have as well. So I think now we have a better idea of how to be prepared. But I think also that other young bands and artists can learn a lot from listening to this. Mm -hmm, absolutely, yeah, Josh. We really appreciate you taking the time. I, you know, I, I'm sure we could talk all day, but we'll have to have you back and chat in further in depth on a few things. Yeah, you know. And Maddie, actually, just talking to you over this last, you know, 20 minutes, yeah. we should almost do like a halfway point podcast on the same one. I'm just, I'm putting it out there. So I'm putting you on the spot, but like to put, we're going in the studio at next month, but what if we did halfway through making the album, we jumped on the same sort of thing. Be good. I, that's That'd be awesome. That's yeah, a great that's idea. Absolutely a great idea. I I would check that out for sure. So yeah, yeah it'd be, great idea. It'd be fun just to see where it's like where things went and if if it was like, you know, if you learned anything or if the band learns anything or you know, yeah, it'd be I think that would also yeah, I would love to watch it. Mm -hmm. Me like too. Let's resolve intro to then halfway through where we're at and that at the end where we're at. Yeah, that's a that's a great idea. It'd be fun. Yeah, done. Let's do it. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks so much, Josh. You know, we could talk to you forever, but uh, we'll, we'll save save some for next time. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. Yeah. Sweet. Well, Maddie and Jory, thank you so much for this. I really appreciate it. Josh Gwillem from OCL. Thanks, thanks so much. much.